question for you is, what story are you writing with your life? What story will you tell with your life? That's the series that we've been, we're ending today. We, we, we started this series several weeks ago, How to Live a Best Seller. We've been asking that question. Our series started with that every story has a character, and then every character will have a problem. But then they meet a guide who gives them a plan to help them find success. And then we get to the last part of our story, of our story elements of storytelling, and it's this, that uh, the character must change. If the character does not change, it's not much of a story at all. If the character is the same as where they started, then that's not a good story. Uh, the character must change brings us to the resolution of the story. For hundreds of years, story writers, script writers, have been using a three-act play. The, the first act is you have conflict, then you have climax, and then you have resolution. Conflict, climax, resolution. Every story out there pretty much has these three elements. Today we come to the resolution of the Exodus story, of Moses' story. So open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31, and I'm going to start reading in verse 1, and we read this. Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all Israel. I am now 120 years old, and I'm no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. Now, as we hear that, we go, man, this is a heartbreaking ending. What kind of resolution is this? Moses doesn't get to go into the promised land. But I think one of the things we see here is that this may be the end of Moses' story. But it's really just a new chapter in Israel's story. And it reminds all of us that we're in a much bigger story than our own. We're part of God. God's story. When this idea of resolution, we want it in any story that we read, any story that we hear. For example, if you go to watch a film, you want to be transported to another land, to another country, another place with a lead character who overcomes evil, who does something heroic, who changes the world, and, and the, the boy meets the girl. We want all of that to happen in 90 minutes, and then we want, to, we want some really good closure and resolution so we can come back to our seats and go home. Uh, for example, if you're watching a film, uh, you want to see, make sure that Dwayne Johnson stops the terrorists. You want to ma make sure that happens. You want the boy to get the girl. You want E.T. to go home. He's got to make it home. If a story doesn't have good closure, if it doesn't have re resolution, they call it the story loop. If the story loop does not close, you don't want to see the movie again. Some movies are poorly written, for example. I'll share this one with you. Maybe you've heard of it, Titanic. I, I think someone did a poor job with this. What happened is, here's what happened. The movie ends. It has no resolution, at least for me, because Leonardo DiCaprio, he drowns. He goes down with his ship. I think a much better ending is he makes it to New York City. They get married, they have kids, and they live happily ever after. That would be a much better story. I don't know what you're thinking. Anyway, so but some stories will give us good resolution. We come to this closing chapter in the story of Moses. Some say that Deuteronomy, where we are, is the resolution for the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. For hundreds of years also, story writers and storytellers have been using three basic or three common story endings. I have them here just to kind of point you where we're going this morning. The, the character, one common ending is the character will achieve a position or status. We see that, for example, if you've seen The Lion King. You have Simba is a lion cub, and then uh, Simba becomes the lion king. So you have that there. You have, for example, in the Bible, you have Joseph is, I'm sorry, David is a boy sheep herder, and then he becomes the king of a nation. A, a second common story ending that is used is the character is united with someone who makes them whole. We see this, for example, in the story of Joseph in the Bible. Joseph becomes the prince of Egypt, but then at the end of the story, his brothers come and find him, and he forgives them, and, and there's resolve, and there's resolution, and they're reunited. That's the kind of closure we want. An example from a film might be Jerry Maguire. So Tom Cruise comes in the room. He sees Renee Zellweger, and he says to her, 
I forget what he said to her, actually. Uh, what he said, um, he says, you complete me. That's what he says. He says, you complete me. And then she says, you had me at hello. You see, that's a good story ending. Unlike other movies like the Titanic, that one you can watch again and again. Uh, I'll, I'll share this one from, from Fables. Your kids know this one well. You have Cinderella. She gets invited to the ball, but then she loses her shoe and she has to run home by midnight, but then she's back and she marries a prince. Oh, and then, of course, this is a good happy ending. They live happily ever after, like Prince Harry and Marilyn Markle. So there you have it. So we want that kind of ending. Here's one last one. The character reaches their full potential. They are at their best. This is how the Moses story ends. Moses had been at his worst. He had lost, where we started with this story is, he lost his temper. He kills a man. So he goes on the run to the backside of nowhere behind Midian, somewhere behind like the superstition mountains. And he's herding sheep. He's living the worst life. And now God brings him back to lead a nation. And that's where this story is, is taking us. What we want to see in every story, though, and what we see in the Moses story is the transformation, the change in the main character. And we see this in Moses' life. So let's go back to our text because here's what Moses says next. This is verse 6 in Deuteronomy 31. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. So this is Moses saying, be strong and courageous. And I said for every story to have good resolution, to be a great story, we have to see the change. We have to see transformation in the main character. We see this finally in Moses at the end of his life. He's 120 years old. So like I said, when you think about who Moses used to be, Moses, like I said, was angry. Not only did he kill a man when he lost his temper, later he smashes the tablets. God tells him to speak to a rock for water, but he takes a stick and he starts beating the rock with a stick. You know, being in the desert will make you do things like that. So Moses was an angry young man earlier. Moses was also afraid. He was angry and afraid. God tells him to go speak to Pharaoh and he says, well, I stutter. I don't speak well at all. I can't do that. I can't lead a nation. Uh, here am I. He says, here am I, God. Use Aaron. Take him. He'll do better than I can. God brings them to the edge of the, the promised land the first time, and Moses agrees with the people. There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers. But that was years and years back. That was 40 years earlier. Now he says these words, be strong and courageous. God can do this for us. That's what Moses is saying now. The entire purpose of practically every story is for us to see the change in the lead character. And so the question out there for your life, is change happening? Is transformation happening in your life? When we hear stories about transformation, they kind of suck us in. It's kind of like this. Uh, James Bryant Smith, who's a theologian at Friends University in Indiana. I've met him there. I've talked to him. He's also, he also teaches widely on subjects of spiritual formation. And he says, some stories pull us in because we see the transformation of the character. We see someone who is humble and simple do something incredible and great, and we want to be like that. He says, for example, he met a man. He met this guy who says he watches the Lord of the Rings every night. <laughs> and James Ryan says, said, he said, I kind of pushed back. Like, that's that really can't be true. He says, you don't really watch The Lord of the Rings every night. And the guy says, yeah, every night. I come home from work, I hit play uh, on the DVR, and then I make dinner, and then I eat dinner watching Lord of the Rings. And what are there, three of them? So he watches them over. And then uh, when I get tired at night, I hit pause. When I come back from work the next day, I hit play again. <laughs> and, and James Bryant Fr Smith said, at first I thought, okay, this guy has lost his mind. He needs to be admitted somewhere. But then he said this thought hit him. Maybe it makes sense because all of us are sucked into those kinds of stories where you have two hobbits living in a hovel and they finally 
have the courage to leave the village and they go out to liberate nations, to conquer evil, and they, they do great things. And we're sucked into those stories because we see the change in the lead character. They have been transformed from hobbits in a hovel to people who are doing great things. And so we see those stories and, and we go, well, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe there's hope for me. An ordinary person can do incredible things. I think, I think because of that hope for transformation in our own lives, I think that's why at a, at a very young age, we start telling our kids story, fables and fairy tales, because some say that all fables, all fairy tales are ultimately about the transformation of the lead character. Maybe you doubt me. I'll, I'll share a few examples with you. So I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm going to mention a story. So we need some crowd participation here. I need you to shout out the name of, of what, uh, what story we're talking about. Okay, so we have a house girl becomes a princess. That took a little while, a little slow there, but thank you very much. All right, let's, let's try another one here. A wooden puppet becomes a real boy. Pinocchio, A plus right here. All right, how about this? An ugly brown duck becomes a swan. The ugly duckling. All right, I didn't, never heard that one answer. All right, we have a beast becomes a prince. All right, this went better last hour, but you guys are doing okay here. How about this one? Stick with me. A water boy becomes an all-star. What film is this? Water boy. There we go. So we love those kinds of stories. By the way, that one, I think, won an Academy Award the same year that Titanic was released. Much better written. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. But we love those stories because we see that there's the possibility of change. Some say that every culture tells these stories. Every culture has these stories of change because all of us hope that we can change. All of us hope that where we are today is not where we're going to end up. We all want change because we hope that who we are today, what we're doing today is not what we'll be doing in the future, that we can do better than that. That's the hope for transformation. You see it in our, in our culture. I think that's why People join health clubs because the hope for change is there. It's why we go to motivational seminars and attend classes. And it's why we read self-help books. We think, I can do better than that. It's why we buy Fitbits and do Botox or whatever that does. Because we hope we can change. But there's something in us also that resists change. And if, and if we're honest with ourselves, we feel this tension of disappointing ourselves, letting ourselves down. Have you ever felt that you knew that you should do something, but you never got around to it? And, and you knew, you just disappointed yourself because you knew you could do better than that. Maybe if you're raising sons or daughters, maybe there's been a night when you walk past their room and you saw them asleep and you go, oh man, an hour ago, they asked if I would come read them a story, and I said, just give me five minutes to answer some emails, but that was 55 minutes ago. And you go, why did I do that again? Why did I put my work over my kids? Or maybe you walk past a coworker's cubicle, and you see tears in her eyes. You know something is wrong, and you know you should stop. But you think, I don't have time for this. I'm busy. I need to go to Subway and get a sandwich. And you just walk on by. Or maybe there's a neighbor who's down the street. You've said hi to them. You've waved. You know that you should have them in your backyard for a barbecue, but you just never get around to it. Now it's been three years, four years. Or maybe you've lost your temper over the smallest thing. You snapped at someone who you love. You said something harsh. And you go, I promise myself. I want to keep doing that. That sense of universal disappointment, I think we all struggle with it. Don Miller, in his book, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, he writes about a friend of his named Randy. And, and Randy's story reminds us how we all think and know, I can do better than what I'm doing right now. He says that Randy, when he was telling him about his daughter, his daughter had just turned 17, and she had gotten invited to her first prom. It was her junior year in high school. And Randy had explained to Don, he said that when she became a teenager, we just didn't talk so much anymore. She seemed to explain things better to her mother. And so she'd been invited to this prom. It was a big deal to her. And then his daughter and Randy's wife went out to go shopping for a dress. 
And when they came back from shopping, they had the dress, but Randy's laying on the couch watching Sports Center. Literally, this is what he says. So he says, I turned down the volume on Sports Center, and she's holding up the dress. Look, Dad. And so I said, Oh, yeah, I like the color. And, I like... and then, then he turns Sports Center back up, and she leaves the room. Ten minutes later, she has the dress on, and she comes in to show him the dress. So he turns down the volume. He's still on the couch. Oh, yeah, that fits you really good, he said. And then she left to go back, meet her mother upstairs. And then he's laying on the couch, and he turns the volume back up, and he starts to think, Randy, you're a loser. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Randy? This is the biggest day in your daughter's life, biggest weekend in her life, and you're laying on the couch watching TV. So Randy told Don, he said, at that point, I decided I was going to write a better story. I was going to write a story in which my story, my daughter's story could come together because our stories were leading in different directions. So Randy said he got up off the couch, turned off the TV, went upstairs, put on a dress shirt and a necktie. Then he put on his fanciest best suit and some shiny black shoes, put on a gold watch, and then went to the bathroom and combed his hair and sprayed some cologne on. And then he walked to his daughter's room and he knocked on the door. And she answered the door and her jaw dropped. She said, what are you doing in a suit? And he could see his wife had pins in her mouth. She had been pinning the daughter's dress to make it fit a little better. And he said, my wife almost swallowed the pins. She said, Randy, what are you doing in a suit? And so he turned to his daughter and he said, when you came in the room a few minutes ago, I want to say what I should have said then. He said, you look stunning. You look gorgeous. I don't even have words tonight to tell you how beautiful you look. But you look absolutely beautiful in that dress. And then he said, I also came to ask, with your new dress on, if I could have the first dance with you in your new dress. And she said, of course. So they went downstairs, and he pulled out some vinyls from when he was in high school, and he put them on the record player. And they started to dance in the living room. And then his wife came, and they danced. And then they started to tell stories about their first prom. He said, we danced and told prom stories until one in the morning. Randy was determined to live a different story, to write a different kind of resolution and ending to his family's story. Randy knew that he could change. I, I wonder if you've ever felt that, you've ever thought that, you've maybe had the thought, I'm better than that. That is not the person who I want to be. If you've ever thought those things, that's your desire for transformation. God himself put it there. This is his promise of Jesus Christ coming into our lives who gives us the power and the ability to change. And, and maybe there's things in your life that you know need to change. And can I ask you this? Have you gone to God and you said, can you help me change this? I want to be a different kind of person. Here's the hope of transformation. I'll put it like this, and this is our Twitter moment for the day, that ordinary people have the extraordinary, can be changed in extraordinary ways, that God can take our lives, no matter how, how far we've wandered from him, he can take our ordinary lives and do something extraordinary in it. I want to end with this thought, with this challenge, and it's this, that if we are going to experience real change in our lives, it requires this. It requires that we return to God and make him the hero, the lead character of our story. So if you have your Bibles, go back to Deuteronomy. This time I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. So go back to chapter 30, verse 1. And Moses writes this to the people of Israel. This is in his resolution. And at the end of his story, he says, if you come back to God, underline those words, your God, and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to everything that I have commanded you, then God, your God, will restore everything you lost. Uh, he will have compassion on you. He will come back and pick up the pieces from all over the places where you've been scattered. No matter how far away you ended up, God, your God, will get you out of there and bring you back to the land that your ancestors once were promised. It will be yours again, and he will give you a good life. Verse 6, God, your God, will cut away the thick calluses on your heart and your children's heart, freeing you to love God with your whole heart and soul, and live, and really live, 
He says all of that. Then verse 8, he says this, and you will make a new start. So you probably didn't notice this, but in this short passage in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses uses one, the same Hebrew word four different times. Now, obviously, we're reading in English, so you didn't spot it, but it's the word teshuva. Four different times he says teshuva. Teshuva means this. Teshuva means to return to something. Teshuva means to re-become. It means to remake. It means to, to turn around. My favorite description of what teshuva means. By the way, teshuva is one of the Hebrew people's favorite words. Every year they have a festival. It was just a week ago. A day set aside just to celebrate teshuva, returning to God, returning to the words of God. But my favorite use of the word teshuva, it means to turn around 180 degrees. It means like you're going one direction, but now you're going to turn around and go this way. If you want to picture what teshuva is like, it's like this. It's, it's like, let's say the day you were born, God puts you on a path. And it's a good path. It's the best path that he has for you. And you're going down this path, but then you decide to do some things that you've you thought were a good idea, and so you leave the path, and you start to wander, and you end up in the deep weeds. You're, now you're off the wagon. Now you're in the wrong place with the wrong people. You're way over here, but then it hits you. I need to get back to the person that God made me to be. So you turn around, and you come back to the path. So that turning around, that's teshuva. That's the whole idea. It's to come back to the person that God made you to be. This idea, teshuva, it, it really implies that there is a version of you that God made you, that when he made you, it, he made you good and beautiful and holy and divine in his image. He made you like that. So he made you like that, good and beautiful, but then we, we all have this tendency to, to, to wander off, to be dishonest, to hurt people with our words, to lose our temper, to do things that we know God doesn't want us to do. But then he get, holds out the, the possibility to return to him, to Shuva. Let's go back, this Deuteronomy chapter 6. This time I want to put this Hebrew word into our reading. And, it, and if we did, it would read like this. If you come back. To Shuva, how do you like that? To God and obey him with your whole heart and soul according to everything that I've commanded you. Then God says, I will restore everything. I will to Shuva everything. And he will come and come back to Shuva and pick up the pieces. So so Moses is saying, if you turn back, then God will, God is a God who goes out and he wants to bring you back to him. There's, there's nowhere that you've wandered too far. He wants, you to, he, he wants you to leave behind some things in the desert and come back to him. Hebrew parents, when, when their sons or their daughters wander away from home and end up in places they shouldn't be there, Hebrew parents will say, Teshuva. Jesus, in the New Testament, I don't know if you remember this, you, he tells Teshuva stories. He talks about a son who leaves home, but then he Teshuvas, and he starts to come back, and the father goes out to meet him, and he Teshuvas him, and he brings him back. And that's what Moses is saying, is that you have a God that no matter where you've wandered to, he goes out and he teshuvas you. He wants to bring you back, help you change and be transformed. Uh, this word, this story that Jesus tells, it was on my mind about a week and a half ago because of something that happened in our family. What happened is, is I have four sons and the youngest son is in college in San Diego at Point Loma Nazarene. And a week and a half ago, he was on his way home, driving home. And I, my last text to him was, go slow up the mountains coming out of San Diego because he's driving a, a 2002 Chevy S10 with 170,000 miles on it. And I said, it's gonna get hot. And it's like 104 degrees that day in the desert. Well, he said he was going up the hill out of San Diego, and he said, but, but Dad, he later told me everybody was passing me, and so I just went faster. And that usually solves everything. But what happened when he 
put his foot on the gas is the radiator blew. And so he's on the side of the road uh, FaceTiming me with his shirt off because it's so hot and asked me to look at the engine. Well, I can see there's coolant everywhere. I, th- I think the radiator's gone. So now he's in the desert. I'm four and a half hours away. And I'm thinking, how do we, we could call a tow truck, but still, what do I do with my son? And so I, uh, I remembered we had a friend whose parents lived not too far from there. And they lived somewhere near Julian. If you know where Julian, then bless you. It's somewhere on the backside of the desert. And so he called his parents and he said, hey, can you go pick up this kid out of the desert? And so they said, sure. And in 20 minutes, they were there. And then that was about 6, 7 o'clock by the time the parents showed up in the evening. And then my, my friend Vern, he called me back and he said, hey, do you want to go pick up your son? I go, sure, I want to go pick up my son. But how? He says, I'll, I'll take you. He said, I have a truck with a trailer. We'll go pick him up and bring him back. I said, sure, when? He said, well, let's leave at 4 a.m. And I said, you'll get up at 4 a.m. and drive almost all the way to San Diego to bring my son home. And he said, yeah, of course I'll do that. You see, I think sometimes we have some friends that are good friends, but then there are some friends that the Bible say stick closer than a brother. And so we got up at four in the morning and drove to San Diego and loaded his S10 on the trailer and drove him back. And as I'm driving back, this thought hit me that your God, our God, It says, I will do that for you. No matter where you are, I will go out and I will bring you back home where you're supposed to be. That's the idea of teshuva. I would would end with this question. As you look at your life this morning, is your story changing? Is change and transformation happening in your life? If you were to look back on your story back one year or three years, or five years, are you a different, a better, more forgiving, more a a person who's pursuing justice, a person who's loving and sharing and is more generous? Is that happening in your life? Or are you the same person that you used to be? Has your life, has your story flatlined? Or, Or maybe worse, has your story gone backwards? Is it a worse story that you're living today than before? My challenge to you today is to realize that you can change. Uh, Through Jesus Christ, that possibility of change, God holds it out for all of us. And I want to encourage you today that, that you really can become a different kind of person. That's the resolution that God wants for all of us. So I want to ask you to do something with me. What happened is, is last month we had our staff at Catalyst in L.A. And you heard Tyler Regan speak last week, who's the president of Catalyst. And while we're at Catalyst, uh, there were speakers. We're in a room with about three or 4,000 people. And as the speakers are speaking, I would hear people start saying, come on, come on, around the room. And I hadn't heard this before. It's mostly millennials and iGens in the room. And I didn't know it was a thing to say, come on. And, and people were saying it so much that finally... Paul Gunther told all the millennials that went with us, he said, you're not allowed to say, come on, the rest of the week here. Uh, But today, I want you to say, come on, all right? And I'm going to ask you to say it about your own life, all right? So we're going to stand up, and we're going to practice this. Everybody stand, everybody stand. And and we're going to practice this, because I want to ask you some questions. But before we do that, let's practice, come on, on three. And it it can't be like a week, come on. It can't be, it's got to be, come on. It's got to be like that. All right, so one two, three. Come on. That was so good. One more time. One, two, three. Come on. All right. So here's what we have here. I want to ask you a few things and just, this is for you. You're not saying it to anyone else, but to yourself. All right. Uh, You can do better than that. Come on. All right. You can stop losing your temper. Come on. You can love her again. Come on. You can forgive him. Come on. You can be more generous. Come on. You can write a better story. Come on. You can write a bestseller with your life. Come on. All right. Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you so much.